thank, thank you, thank you for uh, welcoming me here. It's a wonderful uh, to be visiting you. Um, I will point out, of course, it's not just mere coincidence that we both have the last name, the same last name. Uh, Dr. Laura Klinger is my wife. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is research on adult outcomes. What happens to individuals who were diagnosed as children when they become adults? Uh, how successful are they and what predicts who is successful? Now, a little bit about TEACH, about the TEACH Autism Program. The TEACH Autism Program is the longest running university-based autism program in the United States. It's been around since 1965, the, the clinic has been, um, which in the history of autism is a long time ago. It covers the entire state of North Carolina. So, so all parts of the state of North Carolina, which I don't know what to compare that to in size in, in Asia, but it's a fairly large state in the United States. Um, it was started in 1965 by Dr. Eric Schopler. Part of the history here that I think is important, uh, oh, sorry, uh, that fits with what Laura talked about is that Eric Schopler was actually one of the first people who said, uh, after Bruno Bettelheim had said that parents caused autism, who came out and said, no, they don't. That parents are, in fact, the, the, the most important people to work with children with autism. So it's, a, so it's a very long history to teach autism program here. Uh, the longevity actually provides us with a great opportunity because the teach autism program has been around for so long. It means that we've been working with individuals with autism for many, many years, for in fact, 50 years. So there's a great opportunity to see what happens to children diagnosed with autism when they become adults. Now a little bit about our, our, our pool and our registry. So when we came to, to the University of North Carolina uh, to the Teach Autism program, there were boxes and boxes and boxes of blue sheets of paper in our offices. These boxes and boxes and of blue sheets of paper were every single assessment form since 1965. So we had information from all of these individuals. It turns out we took graduate students and got them cataloging and entering all of this information into the computer. It turned out that there were about 8,000 blue sheets, 8,000 different individuals that we had blue sheets of paper for and assessments for. Many of them had multiple evaluations. So in the 60s, 70s, and 1980s, autism was still very rare. So they would bring people back in to be reassessed every year or every two years. So some individuals had reassessments or reevaluations 11 times. This is a great thing because it allowed us to be able to look at how autism changed across those years. We also have, since 2001, when Dr. Joe Pippen came to the University of North Carolina, we had an autism research registry created where every individual who came through TEACH was put into a computer database. In that database, there are 24,000 individuals, all of whom have allowed us to do research with their, with, with their uh, assessment information. One of the nice things and important things about being a university-based autism program is that data was collected on all of these individuals from the beginning. So the very first standardized autism symptom severity assessment, the Childhood Autism Rating Scale, was created by Dr. Eric Schopler at the University of North Carolina. So we have very early autism symptom severity measures on all of those first 8,000 individuals. We also have childhood IQ on all of them, and we have childhood adaptive behavior on almost all of them. It's a wonderful thing because we have this research quality data going back to 1965. Unfortunately, when we came there, no one had ever used it for anything. In fact, the, uh, the, the, the director of TEACH that Laura 
uh, replaced Dr. Gary Mezhabov said that he often told Dr. Eric Schaffer to throw it away, that no one was ever going to use it. Why would we keep all this, these, these pieces of paper? When we got there, we said, wow, this is interesting. What's happened to, to these individuals? This is the history of autism in front of us. And so we took this information and tried to use it to tell us both about the history of autism and, and how people change when they have autism, but then hopefully also their future as adults. So it allowed us to look at development over time. As, as I said, the first thing that we did with this research was we set our graduate students to entering it all in the computer. It took a lot of time and a lot of effort. They got very tired of entering uh, blue sheets of paper and cataloging, cataloging them. But it allowed us to look at something that we didn't have the statistical techniques to do in the 1960s, 70s, or 80s, to look at growth curves and growth models of, of, of change. So, so these are the data for those childhood assessments, um, looking at how chronological age is related to mental age. Um, what we see is a nice straight line. I'll point out the line is fairly low. If, if the line, if, if, the, if the individuals had an average IQ of 100, we would expect, we would expect that a line, a regression line that fit where chronological age and mental age matched, right? Which would be somewhat higher than this line. It would be sort of flowing along here. It is lower. So for each year older that the individual gets, they gain about half a year of mental age. This corresponds well to the 50 IQ that, you would, that they had on average. They gained about half a year of function, intellectual functioning for each year of chronological age. The other interesting part is they continue, even into their late teens and 20s, to continue to develop intellectually. So the line continues to be straight the entire way. There's no curvilinear function. It doesn't level off or flatten out. Now, when we looked at adaptive behavior, we found something very different for these children. There, the line looks very much identical through about 12 years old. So for, for the first part of the line, in fact, the two lines are superimposed over each other. But once they hit about 12 years old, it flattens out and even drops a little bit. So daily living skills don't seem to improve in the same way as intellectual abilities for these individuals. Okay? This is very interesting to us, but of course it's also historic data. It's data from the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and even the 1990s a little bit. We wondered though, you know, are these applicable to today, and what's, what, what do these mean for these individuals today? At around the same time that we came to the University of North Carolina, the Atlantic Magazine published a story. The story was about Donald T. This is Donald T. Donald T was the very first case of autism that Leo Tanner ever diagnosed, okay? The story that was in the Atlantic described what his life was like in his 60s. He actually was living independently in his parents' house. He was traveling occasionally independently. He drove a car. He had worked, although he had intermittently worked um, during his life. He went to college. We wondered what happened to all of those people that we saw at Teach in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Not one person, but could we find 50 of them, 100 of them, several hundred of them? And our goal has been to find as many of these individuals as we can and look at what has happened to their lives and, and what, what their successes and failures are. So before we go into that, what I want to do is say, well, what do we already know about adults? Okay. What do we know about autism in middle adulthood? What are the factors that predict a positive outcome? 
and what are the implications for intervention programs targeting employment and post-secondary education? Laura's actually talked a little bit about this part already. One of the things we know is that whatever happens, it's going to be a growing problem for us. So when TEACH started, when, when TEACH officially started as a separate program funded by the state in 1972, the rate of autism was one in 2,000. One in 2,000. We know in the United States now, the rate is currently one in 68. For the, for the 2000, this is actually wrong, for the 2002 cohort, which is 21 right now, uh, the 2002 cohort uh, from the uh, Autism Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Group who have uh, evaluated these rates, that group was diagnosed with one in 150. Now, though those are the folks who are turning 21 this year. Now we're at one in 68. So we know the rate of adults with autism is going to be huge. Um, I think for anyone who's in here who's interested in trying to decide what group with autism they want to work with, choosing adults is, is a growth field. There, there, are, there are modest numbers of people working with adults now, but very soon there are going to be very, very many adults with autism, and there are not going to be enough clinicians to work with those adults. If you can gain expertise working with adults today, you will be set to leave the field five years from now. So, the adult services needs, just to again point out how huge this, this challenge is. Samara and Cowan in 2009 reported that the number of individuals with ASD who, who requested vocational rehabilitation services rose 121% in four years. That's from 2002 to 2006, before the rate of autism really accelerated. We know that the rate of requests has more than doubled since then, and we know, based on the rate of diagnosis, that it will increase by 130 additional percent between now and eight years from now. Take that all Take that all told across the last 15 years, 10, 15 years, and we're gonna see eight times as many people becoming adults with autism today as eight to 10 years ago. That, that, that's a strong, huge need. Now, there are a very modest number of groups who are studying adults with autism. We don't have a lot of research, but I will tell you a little bit about what research we already have before talking about the new research that we've been doing. There is research from something called the National Longitudinal Transition Study, number two. Paul Shattuck at Drexel University has published a lot of this research. This, this survey is a national level survey on all individuals who have a disability in high school that requires an individualized education plan. So in the United States, all students who have a disability that affects their schoolwork <laughs> receive an IEP, an individualized education plan that, that, that gives them access to extra services in the school. So this survey is, is, is representing thousands of individuals uh, a representative group of individuals with disabilities in the school system. Some of those individuals, of course, have autism. In this survey, about 2,000 of the individuals had autism. So Paul Shattuck has reported on those 2,000 individuals with autism and what happened to them as they left school for the first few years. The, the Wasteman Center at the University of Wisconsin in the United States also has a longitudinal study where they've been following individuals with autism from the age of their teens into their early 20s. And so we'll, I'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. The United Kingdom has a group headlock headed by Pat Howland that she's been following for a number of years. And the University of Utah 
as a group that they've been following for about 20 years. So these are the other groups that, that have been looking at and following individuals over time to see what happens to those young adults, those teenagers, as they become young adults. So, how, what, what are the needs of this group? And what, are the, what are the findings from these other research studies? The outcomes, so this is, this is data from that National Longitudinal Transition Study uh, by Paul Shattuck and Ann Rue. The outcomes for persons with autism are not great. We have four groups here. We have individuals with autism spectrum disorders, individuals with intellectual disability, what we used to call mental retardation, individuals with learning disabilities, and individuals with specific language impairments. The rate at which these individuals, when they're, by the time they're 21 to 25, the rate at which they've ever been employed, ever had a job any time in their lifetime, is ranging from 53% to 88%. Now the important part here is that the group with autism, only about half of them have intellectual disabilities. We know that in fact about half of individuals with autism do not have intellectual disabilities but yet they're employed at much lower rates than those with intellectual disabilities. They're, they're, they're lower than every other disability category in the National Longitudinal Transition Study. Very few of them work full time, so if they do work, they're unlikely to work full time, and they're working in jobs that pay them much less than other persons with disabilities. So this sets up that we have a large problem that needs to be fixed. Individuals with autism are having difficulty getting jobs, staying in jobs, and being successful in them. Some of the other studies that are out there. Julie Lowndes Taylor and Marsha Malik published a study in 2011 based on 66 individuals. They found only 6% of individuals had a competitive job, a job that required no additional help where they were in competitive employment. 12% were in supported employment situations. That's 18% with a job, 82% without a job. Pat Howland's findings are not very different, somewhat better, 13% in competitive employment, 21% in supported employment. The research from the University of Utah is substantially better, I want to point out. But their sample was entirely a sample of high-functioning individuals with autism. So they found 54% in competitive employment, 7% in supported employment. This looks much better, and it is much better, but they are the, the individuals who are most intellectually capable of having employment. And in the rest of the world, if we said that a group only had 50% employed, we'd say that was very, very poor, given that we want to have 80, 90, 100% employment we get. You'll also see, the other thing I'll point out is, you'll also see that the sample sizes here are very small. 66 individuals, 68 individuals, 41 individuals. So our goal will be to have many more participants in our study. So we said, how can we learn more about adults outcome, adult outcomes? So what we did was we created a caregiver survey and we decided that we wanted to try to find as many individuals as we could who were diagnosed as having autism in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. We proposed to find 300 to 400 individuals. Uh, the data I'm going to report here are on the first 189. We actually now have about 230 collected, but it takes time to pull all that data together and analyze it, and so the data that I'm reporting here are on the first 189. <coughs> These are very fresh data, though. <laughs> uh, I do want to point out that we have many people who have worked with us and helped us with this. Uh, two of our consultants are Paul Shattuck and Joe Pippen, a long list of postdocs and graduate students who have made this work. Uh, the project is funded by Autism Speaks and the Foundation of Hope. So our study goals are to, to describe the outcomes for adults with autism, 
who are diagnosed as children, identify childhood and current factors that predict successful outcomes, and examine the relationship between employment and adult quality of life. Now I want to point out, in this study, we're viewing empo employment as a pivotal gateway to life. Employment for most of us is where we find our purpose for life. It's how we connect up and identify with who we are. It's where a lot of our sense of self-worth and, and feeling good about ourselves comes from. And, and so it, the, 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 the faculty appointment that I have is in rehabilitation counseling. And in fact, this is probably one of the central tenets of rehabilitation counseling. If you want to take people with disabilities and help them move into successful, independent lives, you need to help them find ways to be independent, including be successful in employment. It is a gateway to, to, to all of the good things that life can give us. So we created a, a, a survey. The survey covers many, many things. I'll talk about just a few of them. It's about a three hour survey. We designed it as primarily a caregiver survey. We knew that about half, three, two thirds of our individuals with autism would probably have intellectual disability. Back in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, we used to say 75% of individuals with autism had an intellectual disability. So this meant that we knew that a lot of our individuals that we would be studying probably would have an intellectual disability, which would mean they would not be good at self-report. So we wanted to have this as a caregiver survey. We also do have a self-report version of it, so for every individual who's capable, cognitively capable of self-report, we've also collected information from those individuals. But I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm just going to talk about the caregiver part of the moment. If you have questions, I can tell you. If you have questions at the end, I'm happy to share some of that, though. We also have very much a whole view, per, a whole person view of, of um, functioning for adults with autism. So we're going to think about things like daily living skills, employment, physical and mental health, living, their living situation, friends and acquaintances. This all has this complex web that leads to success. That, that have a successful, happy life. We hope that we, we can find ways that these things interconnect with individuals. The things that we measured then are um, a variety of things, both from their childhood, so we have these data from their childhood that we could use, as well as new measures. So we measured autism symptom severity, we have childhood CAR scores, and we have their, their current social responsiveness scale, SRS scale scores. We have measures of intellectual functioning. Okay, so we have their childhood IQ. We couldn't assess IQ though by caregiver report. So, but, so our best proxy uh, that we could assess in a brief fashion during this, this survey was to ask caregivers about the conversation ability, conversational ability of the individual with autism. We have daily living skills measured, so we have childhood violence, but we also have the wasteman activities of daily living scale measure their daily living skills. And then we have a wide variety of adult outcomes that we're measuring. We're measuring uh, many, many aspects of employment, uh, quality of life using the Shaylock and Keith measure, which is appropriate both for individuals with intellectual disabilities and those without. We're measuring anxiety and depression using the Adams, the anxiety, depression, and mood scale, which is also appropriate for both individuals with intellectual disabilities and those without. We're measuring a lot of aspects of friendships and, and social activities. We also have many other measures that I'm not going to talk about today, but if you have questions about them, I'm happy to try to answer them. We measured many aspects of the services that individuals used or are receiving. We have aspects of the burden that caregivers feel in taking care of their child with autism. We have many measurements about their physical symptoms and physical well-being. So, here's our sample. Our sample is 189 individuals. They are on average 35 and a half years old, ranging from 21 years old to 64 years old. 80% are male, which is great. That looks like the four to one ratio of males to females we often see for individuals with autism. It's an ethnically diverse sample that looks a lot like the state of North Carolina. One of the things that's interesting and important about TEACH is that TEACH offered all of their services free 
from its inception until around 2011, 2012. This meant that every individual, regardless of economic resources, could come to teach and receive services. So our sample matches that very well. The caregivers who responded to our surveys, as you can see, were mostly moms. Some dads, a few both, there's 4% others, which are other relatives predominantly, aunts, sisters, brothers, who are, who are responding, and 1% and of a guardian who is not a family member, okay? But mostly moms and dads, others and fathers. <coughs> if we look at our childhood functioning of our sample, just to see what it looks like, we find, we find this distribution of intellectual functioning about 40% of our individuals had an IQ of 70 or above. 60% had some intellectual disability by that standard. 20% had an IQ of 85 or above. So this is, this is a sample that looks very representative of the sample of individuals with autism during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Now, where are these individuals living? These are individuals in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s and 60s. It turns out half of them, about half of them, live with family members. They live with family members still. 11% live relatively independently. And about 34% live in some sort of either group home or institutional setting. Okay. So we have, a, we have a mixture of where people are living, but mostly people are living at home. Uh, this means since these individuals are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s, this often means that family members are caring for them in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Okay, so there's a lot of old, older caregivers who are taking care of these individuals with autism. The next, thing, the next thing we ask is, what, is the, what are the educational outcomes for our individuals with autism? Did they go to school? Did they finish school? What happened? For, for our sample, 32% got a regular education diploma. About half got something that's called a certificate of completion. This means they spent their full years in school but we're not able to actually graduate and complete all the degree requirements to graduate from high school. Many did not finish. A few got an occupational diploma track or a GED, which is a general education diploma. It's a test that you take after high school to show that you've now learned the things you might have learned in high school. We also looked at how many of them went to college or went to secondary, post-secondary education. Of this sample, 22% at some point started post-secondary education of some sort. This could be going to a university, it could be going to a vocational school, it could be going to a community college. Of that 22%, about half finished their, their, their college experience. So, so, so we see that the educational attainment is fairly low here. We also asked their parents what areas of help their child, or we asked the caregivers, what areas of help do, does their child need? Um, what we found is that caregivers reported that these individuals with autism needed help in a lot of areas. So they needed help in financial matters, meal preparation, health care. The fewest needed help in hygiene, about half were successful at taking care of their own personal hygiene, cleaning, social activities, community activities. Parents saw that the, their individuals with autism that they took care of needed a lot of help. Now the next thing we looked at though and wondered about is, well, is this really just a factor <coughs> associated with well, So, so we, first we totaled up how many activities each individual needed. Of those seven things that we had in, on this previous slide, so of these seven activities, we find that about half of the individuals needed help in all seven activities. And then a mixture of people needed help in none of the activities, one of the activities, two of the activities. 
So we wondered, is this really just a function of intellectual functioning? We know that about half, a little bit over half of our individuals had intellectual disabilities. Those may be the individuals who need help in everything. So we looked at how the developmental level was related to the number of areas of help people needed. So we split the group then by those with poor conversation abilities as our group of current individuals with current intellectual difficulties. And we find for that group that in fact most of them need help in a lot of areas. There are very few individuals who need no help. Most of them need a lot of help. What was more surprising to us is if we took the individuals who have good language abilities, which should be the individuals who don't have intellectual disability, we find that they're really a mixture of how much help they need. Some of those individuals with good language abilities need no help, 20% of them. But many need a lot of help, okay? So there are many individuals out there with autism who have good intellectual functioning, good language abilities, who still need a lot of help with many aspects of life. We also looked at what services people were actually using so we asked, you know, what, what services do people use? We asked this question both, what services have they used since high school and what services have they used in the last two years? Since high school, we see that people are using a lot of different kinds of services. We asked about 17 areas. Uh, these are the seven highest areas of help that people are receiving. We see a lot of people who need mental health care, a lot of people who need transportation and independent living skills, a lot of job training and job coaching, residential health and social work. Now, if we look at what's happened in the last two years, we can see where change may be happening and where people may be losing services. And what we see is the big difference there. Mostly the scores look very similar if we look just in the last two years, but in job, preparation or job coaching, you see the greatest losses of, of services being received, okay? So let's look at how that translates into employment. So we looked at how many of our individuals are currently employed, how many have ever been employed, and how many have never been employed. We've broken our data into that, those three categories. It turns out from our sample, but 189 individuals, 43% had a job at the time of the survey. 20% had had a job at some point in their life, but were not able to keep it and did not have a current job. And 37% never had a job, okay? We asked questions about how they found their job. It turns out they found their job in a wide variety of ways. Some, 18% found their job independently. This is 18% of the 43%. But many, many more found their job either with help from an agency, help from a parent or family member, or by the residential facility or vocational facility that they went to, often a sheltered workshop. So individuals need help getting into the employment. They're, they're not very successful at finding employment by themselves. Now, the kinds of jobs that people have, though, are really a wide variety of kinds of jobs. We had, we found individuals who are in the computer industry, statisticians, computer programmers, technicians, computer technicians, database developers. We found one research biologist, several people who are in, 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 in as financial assistants or in accounting, People who work with animals as veterinary technicians or plants in nurseries. But most of our folks that we found either work in the food service industry, in customer retail service, or they work in warehouses. Many of them were very underemployed. So for instance, one of our individuals that we know very well and work with frequently has a mathematics degree from a local university, the, the technical university that's closest to us. He graduated with a good GPA, but he works stocking shelves at the local grocery store at Trader Joe's. Um, that's, that's his job, that's the job that he can keep. Um, so a lot of our individuals 
have difficulty finding employment, and when they do find employment, they're often underemployed. The next question that we want to ask is, what is the relationship between employment and current functioning? What predicts whether who is employed and who is not employed? We looked at three classes of variables, so we wanted to look at symptom severity. Does how severe your autism symptoms are affect whether you can get a job and keep a job? Your intellectual functioning and your daily living skills. So it turns out on the, on the social responsiveness scale, if we compare those three groups, those who are currently employed, those who have been previously employed, and those who have never been employed, and look at the social responsiveness scale. Now these are raw scores, these are not the T-scores, these are raw scores of the SRS. What we find is, folks who currently are employed have fewer autism symptoms than those who have been previously employed but can't currently hold a job or those who have never been employed, okay? So, so less aut autism symptoms for those who currently got a job. If we look at their conversation ability, our measure, our, our proxy measure of intellectual functioning, we find a similar relationship where those who have current employment have better conversational abilities than those who are previously employed, that is, statistical difference, and much better than those who are never employed. Not a surprise, intellectual functioning is related to uh, the outcome. The previous, for most of the literature, the best predictor of employment has been intellectual functioning. Now the third variable we looked at then is daily living skills. This is using the Wasteman date activities of daily living and measures things like whether you can make your bed, do laundry, cook a meal for yourself, take care of your own grooming, engage in shopping, finances. Um, anyone who's looking can see the, the effect size is getting much larger there. Um, what we found there is that in fact there were very large effects uh, for daily living skills with again those who are currently employed being the most successful in employment. Okay. Now we also then looked at all three of these things at the same time. So the fact is, of course, that symptom severity, daily living skills, and intellectual functioning are all intercorrelated. Each one is related to the other. So we want to look at the independent contribution of them. When we do that, the only thing that has an independent contribution here is daily living skills. Daily living skills is the only thing that independently predicts who's doing well in employment and who's got a job and who doesn't. Intellectual functioning, or at least conversation ability, does not. Symptom severity does not, okay? Daily living skills has a large predictive component. Now, of course, this isn't surprising. If you can cook a meal for yourself, you're gonna be able to have a job better, uh, yeah, an independent job better. If you can um, take care of yourself in, in, in finances, you're gonna have, be more capable of having a job. It could be that, in fact, having a job makes you better at daily living skills. So Julie Lowndes Taylor has published research that shows that having a job can actually improve your daily living skills. So we actually wanted to go back and look at childhood factors then, okay? If we look at childhood factors in the same way, what we see is really interesting. For those who are currently employed and those who are previously employed, we see very similar symptom severity and lower symptom severity than those who are never employed, okay? So these two groups look the same here. Remember, they did not look the same in adulthood, but they do look the same during childhood. If we look at intellectual functioning, we, we see again that the two groups with, who, who either had a job previously, but not currently, or currently do have a job, look very much the same and not surprisingly, they are the individuals who have better intellectual functioning than the folks who have never been employed. Okay? Now, the thing that distinguishes then between those currently employed and those previously employed is daily living skills, those that adaptive behavior on the body. This is, it's a, it looks like a small difference, but it is a strong, significant difference. Um, and what's especially interesting is 
there's a really large discrepancy between intellectual functioning and daily living skills in this group compared to that group, okay? So the group who has better daily living skills is doing better. This is really important because this says that perhaps the reason why the two groups are different in adulthood may be because they have differences in daily living skills, not because just of their previous, of their employment status. So if we again look at the independent contribution of each of these, so to what degree does each one independently predict uh, employment? It turns out that the only one that matters is the Vineland, just like we saw with the Wasteman daily living scale. So it looks like daily living skills is the pivotal key to employment. And in this case, this is childhood daily living skills. There's no way that employment could cause those daily living skills. Now, next thing I want to talk about then is the relationship between employment and all the other aspects of life. So we wanted to look at many things. We, we, had, we had data on lots of different aspects of life, so we looked at a wide variety of things. Um, using the Shaylock and Keith measure, there are four different measures, sub-measures within the Shaylock and Keith of parts of quality of life. One measure is life satisfaction. Okay, how happy are does, does the, is the individual with their life? One is their sense of belonging. Do they feel like they have a place in the world? And if, you know, a place where people count on them, need them, that they have a, an important role. Empowerment, how much do they feel like they can do things in the world? And then the fourth one is confidence. Turns out that on the Shaylock and Keith measure, confidence is almost entirely defined by having a job. So we didn't include that here since, of course, People who have a job have to be, by definition, higher on confidence on that measure. But what we see is that those who are employed are higher in all of these aspects. They have a greater sense of life satisfaction. They have a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging. And they have a sense of empowerment, that they can go out and do things in the world, change things. If you talk to these individuals, one of the things they report is they love being paid. They love being paid because they can use that money for whatever they want. And they have that control to use their money to buy things that they want. And that gives them a sense of control over their world. They don't have to ask their parents to buy them things. And they may say yes, they may say no. They, they have a control over themselves and their world. We also asked them about friendships. It turns out that we, and we measured friendships in many ways. We measured how much contact they have with friends, how frequent it is, what different kinds of contact with friends, email, chatting, phone calls versus in-person contacts. We, we created a summary score uh, for, across these. And what we see is that those who have a job have more contact with friends. Perhaps because they have more sense of empowerment, Perhaps because they have a sense of belonging, um, but they have much more contact with friends. Finally, we asked about mental health. We know that, in fact, there are very high rates of anxiety in the world in, in adults with autism. Some estimates are 60 to 80 percent of indi individuals with aut autism have some anxiety. We know that there are high rates of depression. Um, some estimates are 30 or 40 percent of individuals with autism. Uh, adults with autism being depressed. So we also saw that, in fact, being employed led to fewer symptoms of anxiety and fewer symptoms of depression. Now, it's important to point out, I think, that the, 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 the relationship to depression is somewhat stronger here. A lot of our individuals with autism who are employed still report being anxious. They, re they report that going to work makes them anxious. They don't know sometimes what's going to happen. They don't know how they're going to be treated by other people. It makes them nervous. They do it anyway because, in fact, they like their job and they like the things that it gives them. But it does make them anxious, and the job doesn't completely make their anxiety go away. But it does make it lower than if they didn't have a job. Okay, so some conclusions that I want to draw here. First off, we do see that many of our individuals with autism, when they enter adulthood, and even as they remain adults, will need substantial support. And many of them will need substantial support throughout their entire lifetimes. 
we need to think about providing supports for employment skills and helping them get jobs and keep jobs. These are often important all the way throughout their entire employment. So we've got individuals, we have a supported employment program at TEACH that employs, that, that, that supports 300 individuals with autism in jobs, in competitive jobs. Some of these individuals, when they're first starting out, we may work with on a daily basis. Other individuals, we may check in with them and check in with their boss once every two weeks. But this is really important, the support is really important. One of the things that we find is, uh, when, we, when this support is removed, so if vocational rehabilitation tells us they can't pay for any more support, and we remove that support, as soon as a new boss comes in who doesn't understand the, the individual with autism, all of a sudden that person ends up getting fired, even if they've had that job for five, six years up until that point. If we, we as job coaches and support can actually, when, the, when a new boss comes in, talk to that individual, provide some, some, some intervention to help them understand how to work with a person with autism, and often decrease that, 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 that difficulty of transition to a new boss. Uh, college supports are important. Uh, as Laura pointed out, we ran for, for many years at the University of Alabama a college support program, and we saw individuals, before we did this, we saw individuals frequently fail out of school. They would go to college for one semester, two semesters, get failing grades, and leave and have to come home. And what they needed is some support, not someone to do their academic work for them, but someone to help them understand how to communicate with their professors, how to work on group projects with other individuals, how to organize their time. And that support program has made that, that those individuals much more successful. Finally, we know that those daily living skills are absolutely pivotal. Now I want to point out, this is the message here I want to provide is actually an incredibly hopeful one. So for all the parents who are out here, you should, you should hopefully take this message as extremely hopeful. It's very difficult to change your child's IQ. It's very difficult to change your child's autism symptoms. Daily living skills are very teachable. You can teach your child to shower. You can teach your child to manage money. You can teach your child to make a meal for themselves. And each time you teach them an independent skill, they're going to get confidence from that. They're going to be willing to try things and be more adventuresome and be more successful, hopefully. So, so I do want to point out that those, those working on those daily living skills is pivotal. And if you can teach, and, and it's hopeful, if we can teach our children to do these daily living skills, we can increase their success in the life. I also want to point out our results are very comparable to what we're seeing with childhood studies. So if we compare our studies directly, our findings directly to those from uh, Paul Shattuck and Anne Rue's research, we find in the current study that we have 63% people, of people ever being employed, very similar to the 55% that they report. We find that 43% of our individuals are currently employed, very similar to the 34% that they report. Now, of course, our individuals have had longer to, to gain employment. Our individuals are on average 34 years old, 35 years old, not 21 years old. We see that it's going up a little bit, but not enough. So we certainly do want to see, and, and we need to work on ways to increase these, these employment outcomes even higher. Again, as I pointed out, both childhood and adult daily living skills were the single best predictor of employment above and beyond symptom severity. In fact, those childhood daily living skills predicted the difference ah. sorry. <laughs> the, 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 those childhood daily living skills predicted the changes that happened in symptom severity on the SRX. Okay? So 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 something about teaching your children early daily living skills is actually causing fewer symptoms as adults. That's a really important thing again. If we can give them daily living skills, they're going to have perhaps fewer symptoms. This is probably because some of those symptoms are due to their anxiety and not being able to control their environment. If you can control your environment a little bit, you're gonna have less anxiety about the world and your symptoms are gonna be lower. Now, even for those with good conversation skills and average intellectual abilities, I wanna point out it's important to, point to, to, to work on these daily living skills. 
Laura already used a couple of my favorite examples. Uh, individuals who had college success, uh, college academic skills, who had received full, full academic scholarships to go to university, um, but who couldn't shower. Um, we had individuals, we had individuals our first year of running our college program who were incredibly bright, gifted individuals, but because they didn't know how to work an alarm clock, failed several courses um, because they couldn't get up on time. And once they missed, they missed three classes in a row, they thought, oh, they were embarrassed to go to their professor, and they stopped showing up for class because they were embarrassed they had missed uh, a whole week of classes in a row. So we need to work on these skills with all of our individuals. And this is, this is I just want to point this, this out again for all of the parents who are out there. This is a great mantra to keep in mind for all of our individuals. Whenever we're doing something, we should always ask, is this something I need to do for them, or is this something I can work on with them? So it's lunchtime on the weekend, it's Saturday, they want lunch, they're hungry. Instead of just making them dinner when they say, or lunch when they say, I want lunch, help them make lunch, right? Make them responsible for making their own lunch. Help them do it. Make it an opportunity to give them daily living skills. Um, so, 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 so instead, it, one, one of the things that we find for a lot of our parents, um, when we interview and talk to our parents is, that they report that working on academics, so a lot of our students with autism, they're, they're succeeding in high school, but they're also succeeding in high school because parents are helping them a lot. They're reminding them, oh, you've got a paper due tomorrow. Oh, you've got a te math test due. And they're supervising them and studying for those, and they're making sure they're studying in the right way. And that's helping them succeed. But by the time they get done with all that, the parents are tired. And when the parents are tired, it's easier to do things for your child with autism than to ask that child with autism and insist that that child with autism do things by themselves or do things on their own with some help. And, and what we need to do is we need to do more of insisting that our children with autism do things as independently as they're capable because that will help them in the long run in life much more. I do want to point out also it's crucial for us to be targeting employment for all of our individuals with autism. We found that in our research, even those with the lowest intellectual abilities, those who are employed, were happier, had that higher sense of belonging, and had that feeling of empowerment compared to those with intellectual disabilities who did not, who were not employed. We found at every single level of intellectual functioning, employment led to better outcomes. We need to help people get uh, into employment, and we need to help them get into employment earlier. One of the best predictors of adult employment is having a job when you're a teenager. Okay, so if you can help them have a job when they're a teenager, that's gonna make them much more successful at having a job as an adult. So employment plays a crucial role in improving many of the things that are important to us in life. It's also important though when we do this, to not just make them try to get into employment and let them do it by themselves entirely. We need to provide enough support so they can be successful. Uh, that can be supports in job training and job coaching, in daily living skills, and as Laura talked about, those, those social skills and emotion regulation. Um, and we need these across the entire spectrum, from lower functioning to higher functioning, from, from those making the transition as young adults to those who are older. One of the things that we're gonna start seeing is parents who can't take care of their individuals anymore, who have lived in their parents' house for 50 or 60 years. It's gonna be a very huge challenge for those individuals to transition into a new living situation after 50 years of living in the same environment. And so we need to start thinking about how to help those individuals to handle aging and autism as well. Thank you very much.